so much. Welcome. Good morning. And um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is the pre-retirement program for UC faculty and staff. And I am Marianne McIver, your friendly neighborhood health care facilitator for UC Santa Cruz. Um, before we begin today, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I do have pauses for questions uh, built into the program. And you are welcome to place your questions into the chat. Uh, while we're going along, since we are recording today, um, it, uh, it, it helps us to produce a very good recording if you keep your line on mute um, so that we don't pick up background noise that can be distracting to folks. And as we go along, um, I, again, invite questions, but I ask that you please not share personal health information because um, that's not appropriate for a public forum. And also uh, following our presentation today, uh, you'll be sent a survey and those are very helpful to let us know how we can continue to improve um, our programming. So thank you for in advance for completing the survey. Um, folks are asking me already, when is open enrollment happening? Uh, today's program is not about open enrollment, but open enrollment will begin on October the 31st. And though I will not be covering open enrollment uh, changes today, I want everyone to know that all information about open enrollment will be available beginning tomorrow, October 24th at the website listed here. The short URL is ucal.us forward slash OE. And open enrollment will be ending for UC uh, retirees and faculty and staff on Friday, November 22nd. That's the Friday before Thanksgiving. And it ends at 5 p.m. sharp. So if you want to make changes, be sure to do them by 5 p.m. Friday, November 22nd. I also want to take this opportunity to provide a heads up that UC will be conducting a routine re-verification of family members next year. Um, we work with uh, Unify HR, which is a trusted partner that the University of California works with. And as a steward of public funds, UC verifies the eligibility of family members and uh, periodically re-verifies family members uh, that where relationships can change, such as spouses, domestic partners, and stepchildren or step-grandchildren. So uh, beginning in February 2025, uh, folks with any of those kind of relationships that they're covering family members on will receive uh, a request to verify those family members, and that is a legitimate request for information. So Today, we will be covering the UC Retiree Health Program. So uh, my intention today is to uh, provide information to folks that are retired already and would just like to kind of refresh or relearn or uh, get an overview of the Retiree Health Program. And then folks that are preparing for retirement, uh, that's really my target audience, folks that are preparing for retirement and want to know about the retiree insurance options, who is eligible, what does it cost, how does it work with Medicare, and all of those questions should be answered by the time that we end today. First, I want to give you the small print. So the UC retiree health benefits are uh, described in the retiree handbook on page 15 of the retirement handbook. Um, the, the This uh, is quoted from. And unlike pension income, which is a vested entitlement, meaning that it cannot be denied, UC health and welfare benefits are not accrued or vested benefit entitlements. UC's um, contribution towards the monthly cost of the medical and dental coverage is determined by UC and may change or stop altogether. Um, so today's presentation captures the structure in place as of the date of the presentation. I encourage you to keep informed on this uh, by becoming a member of the UC Retiree Association or the UC Emeriti Association. And you may also follow news, news updates on UCNet, um, searching the Retiree Health Working Group. But I will say that UC has recommitted over, uh, over and over again to continue to offer retiree health benefits. But I'd just like to uh, 
be certain that folks know that, um, you know, it can change over time. And it does, you know, it changes from year to year. The, the funding changes from year to year. The retirees are most interested in continuing medical plans, dental plans, and vision plans. For all the plans listed above, retirees can enroll and change during the annual open enrollment. Um, some folks believe that uh, in, in error that once you retire, you can't change your health plans. You can change your health plans. The retirees are offered an open enrollment period each year in the same way that employees are offered open enrollment each year. So uh, as uh, plans uh, change and your needs change, you can make those changes every open enrollment. What you can elect during open enrollment, medical and dental, and any other plans that are announced. Um, the uh, enrollment, uh, open enrollment dates are generally the same as for employees. And outside of open enrollment, uh, retirees can make changes for certain life events. And for those, they must uh, self-identify to retirement administration within 31 days of the event. So for example, like a new marriage or a new domestic partnership or adoption of a child. You can uh, cover those eligible family members, but you need to let UC Retirement Administration know that you had a family uh, life event to, um, to uh, initiate that coverage. So if you have a question about whether uh, a life event is eligible for a change, contact RASC, or you can contact me as well. Other insurance options that are available uh, include these. And the legal plan can continue, and that'll deduct from your pension income, just as it deducts from your employment income while you're working. There is a retiree version of accidental death and dismemberment, or I have it abbreviated here on the slide as AD&D. &D. That coverage is not available to deduct from pension income. You direct pay to Prudential. And the, the supplemental um, health plans those uh, hospital indemnity plans, accident and critical illness, um, those coverages can continue if you convert those uh, or port them at the time that you leave UC employment and you pay that directly uh, to Prudential, the current in, uh, supplemental health insurance carrier. Life insurance that you have as an employee generally ends when employment ends, but again, uh, you have the option to convert or port the life insurance plan following your uh, uh, termination of employment when you retire by paying premiums directly to Prudential. Disability insurance is insurance on your paycheck. So that coverage ends on the last day that you receive UC pay as an employee and is not available for continuation. Any auto, home, or renter's insurance that you have through the university's uh, relationships with Cal Casualty or Farmers Insurance can continue via direct pay. So you have to set up direct payment for, with Cal Casualty or Farmers Insurance or you know, write them a check every month. Pet insurance is the same. You can continue that coverage. It's available to UC retirees, but it's not eligible to have deducted from your pension income check. So you direct pay to Nationwide. And the health flexible spending account and dependent care flexible spending accounts are tax savings plans. Um, and those coverages end when employment ends. So retirement involves a termination of employment. And that means that your uh, coverage ends when um, you leave UC employment. However, for the health flexible spending account, um, if you choose to, you can continue the health flexible spending account via COBRA, but there's you lose the tax advantage. So you don't have any uh, pre-tax income from uh, that is eligible for those pre-tax deductions. But if you need to continue coverage in order to recoup what you've contributed so far, that is available to you. So what if, if you attended a planning for retirement session, you're familiar with these options, lump sum cash out or monthly income. If you did not attend that presentation, you can visit the shr.ucsc.edu website 
and uh, visit the on-demand benefits workshops to view a recording of that session or attend one of the monthly sessions provided by RASC. Um, the point of the slide is to convey that if you elect to receive the lump sum cash out option rather than monthly income, as uh, if you receive that as your retirement election, then you forfeit your right to continue UC sponsored health plans. So um, UC sponsored health plans are only available to continue if you elect monthly income. So who is eligible for UC retiree health? These are the these are the, the following are the rules for all groups. And this is from the retirement handbook, also on page 15. Um, and they require that you are enrolled or eligible to be enrolled in UC employee health coverage when you retire. At the time of retirement, you must have accrued 10 or more years of UCRP service credit or to be eligible for continuation of medical and dental uh, health coverage. Your retirement date must be within 120 days of the date you end UC employment, and you must choose to receive monthly UC income, uh, except for our savings choice participants. So the point here is, is that um, retiree health is not available if you elect the lump sum cash out or LSC. You must have continuous creditable health coverage from the university or from outside UC until your UC retiree health becomes effective. So if you um, are covered by a, um, a, a spouse um, that is creditable coverage, for example, then that uh, allows you to be eligible for UC retiree health. If you're rehired into a position after a prior separation, you must work at least 12 months in a UCRP eligible position to retire with retiree health eligibility. And once you're retired, you must enroll in Medicare if eligible and assign uh, your Medicare coverage uh, to your medical plan when applicable. So those are the retiree health eligibility requirements that everybody must satisfy. Who else is eligible besides you, the UC retiree? Uh, your family members. And these are the same uh, family members that are uh, eligible to be covered under UC employee coverage. So that includes a spouse, a domestic partner, children up to age 26, uh, grandchildren that meet the requirements, so they have to be your tax dependent. Legal wards also have to be a tax dependent. And overage disabled children. Um, disabled uh, children have to have um, met the eligibility prior to age 22 in order to carry that coverage into retirement. Um, this is a list of the eligible family members, and this is also included in the retirement handbook. And just a reminder that um, uh, unless your domestic partner is your tax dependent, the value of the contributions that UC provides are subject to imputed income. And so those will be subject to taxation. And that UC also verifies the eligibility of family members following the enrollment. So UC takes the trust but verify approach and some family members are subject to periodic re-verification for relationships that can change over time, such as marriage or domestic partnership. What does retiree health insurance cost? Well, it varies. There are many variables that determine what you pay for UC medical and dental coverage as a retiree, and they're listed here. And these include the cost of the plan that you have chosen, uh, the the uh, university's contribution, and if you're subject to graduated eligibility, the percentage of UC's contribution for which you're eligible. There are three distinct retiree health groups, groups one, two, and three, and I'll go over those as we go forward. And also who else is covered besides you? Uh, coverage for you plus a spouse or a partner is going to be more expensive than you by yourself. Uh, Medicare coordination also has an effect on the retiree 
um, premiums that are payable. And I have in grayed out uh, ink, uh, maybe subject to collective bargaining. It's not at this time, but that's always a possibility in the future. So I've just included that in gray ink um, in case that comes into effect at some future date. Um, there is uh, for retirees that are subject to graduated eligibility that you know, folks that retire with less than 100% of UC's contribution, which I will cover as we go along, there is a link on this page that takes you to a retiree premium estimator. The 2024 rates are currently linked to that page. The 2025 rates aren't quite available yet, but they will be um, by the 1st of November. So after... Um, Tess sends you the slides for this deck. You can follow that link over there to get an, an estimate of what it will cost for you in retirement. And um, the university expects that retirees will share in the cost of health plan premiums. Um, several years ago, the Retiree Health Work Group, um, in the face of increasing premiums over time, established a baseline for cost sharing strategy for UC retiree medical. This was in around 2012, 2013, and um, has remained stable since then. So the university committed to a maximum contribution towards UC medical uh, is uh, going to be equivalent to 70% of the aggregate cost. So if we look over the entire menu of options, they, take, they aggregate those costs and UC's maximum contribution towards the medical plan rates is equivalent to 70% uh, of that aggregate cost. Of course, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are variables, who else you're covering, which plan you're choosing, those kind of things. Graduated eligibility is a big part. Um, those, are, those can create variables, uh, but if you are eligible for UC's maximum contribution towards the UC medical premium, it's going to be equivalent to about 70%. So if you if I put it another way, if you're eligible for 100% of UC's contribution, you're eligible for 100% of the 70% maximum contribution. I hope that um, creates clarity around what the retiree cost sharing is. And as I mentioned, there are three distinct UC retiree health groups, and those are uh, delineated by your membership date with the UC retirement plan, when you were hired and became eligible for UC retiree benefits. For the first group, um, those are uh, folks that were hired and have been working without a break in service since January 1, 1990, or, or excuse me, prior to January 1, 1990. So um, over time, that's, that's quite a, a few years ago, that's 34 years ago, uh, most of those folks are already retired. So many people on this call are either in group two or group three. Group two are the folks that be, uh, attained UC retirement plan membership anytime between January 1, 1990 and June 30th, 2013, or could have been a later date uh, subject to when your, uh, your union uh, agreed to the group two um, um, retiree health uh, eligibility. And that is a graduated eligibility based upon your years of service. You need at least 10 years of service to qualify for 50% of UC's contribution. And then it increases um, by 5% each year up to 20 years. And at 20 years, you're eligible for 100% of UC's contribution. Group three are the folks that were hired or rehired after July 1, 2013. And for the group three folks, it's a percentage of the UC contribution ranging from zero to 100% based upon a combination of your age on the day you retire and the service credit that you've attained. Essentially the 100% um, is reached if, if you're in group three, if you are have worked uh, 20 years or more at UC and are age 65 on the date that you retire. The Retiree Handbook has the charts available on page 16. 
And um, if you uh, became an active member of UC Retirement Plan or Savings Choice or were rehired into a UC RP eligible position after a break of more than 120 days, you'd be in group three. And I'll go through these more detailed uh, as we go along. But first, a few words about Retiree Health Service Credit. Um, UC Retiree Health Service Credit includes any periods of membership in the UC Retirement Plan, as well as any periods as a savings choice participant. So the university is institutionally neutral about the selection of how you want to receive your retirement income and counts both UC Retirement Plan Service Credit and service credit earned while a savings choice member. Um, that uh, service credit is earned in direct proportion to the time worked in an eligible position, and retiree health service credit is forfeited if you take a refund of your UC retirement plan accumulations or a distribution of your savings choice balances before your retirement date. And again, you can read more about this in the Retirement Handbook, um, which is um, available uh, on the UCNet website. So getting back to the eligibility rules, again, group one is if you uh, attain membership before January 1, 1990, you are eligible for 100% of UC's maximum contribution. And <laughs> think about it, if you've been working since uh, prior to January 1, 1990, you have way more than 20 years of service credit anyways, very likely. Group two is the folks that were hired between 1990 and June 30th of 2013. Without a break in service, you are subject to graduated eligibility. If you have at least 10 years of service credit, you're eligible for 50% of UC's contribution maxing out to 100% of UC's contribution at 20 years, with a caveat that if your age plus service credit equals or exceeds 75, then you automatically qualify for 50% of UC's contribution. Otherwise, you're not eligible. Graduated eligibility for group three is applicable to members of the 2013 tier of the UC retirement plan and members of the 2016 tier of the UC retirement plan. Those are folks that were hired or rehired uh, on or after July 1, 2013. And there's some later dates in there for some unions, because some unions uh, elected it later on, but for most people it's July 1, 2013. And um, the, again, the UC's contribution ranges from eligible to, to participate, but with no UC contribution, so 0%, up to the maximum 100% of the maximum contribution based upon a combination of your age and years of service credit. And again, please reference the Retirement Handbook, page 16, to see that chart. You need to have at least 10 years of service credit and you uh, to have a UC contribution you have to be at least 56 years or older on the date that you retired. UC's contribution starts at age 56 and increases uh, each, uh, each successive year based upon your age with combination of UC retirement service credit. And again, the maximum contribution is reached at age 65 with 20 or more years of service credit. When you log into UC Rays to look at your service credit, your retirement group isn't listed, which um, is a um, enhancement that I think will be added at some point in the future. But for now, if you're uncertain about which retiree health, health group you belong to, you can contact me to inquire. Um, and um, your retiree health work uh, excuse me, your retiree health group number will be automatically included in your personal retirement profile when you initiate the retirement process. But if you're just looking at an estimate, it's uh, not listed on your website. So feel free to reach out if you have a question. So what does 100% look like? Um, if you're eligible for 100% of UC's contribution, so you've attained that 20 years of service credit, um, then um, there is the cost sharing is based upon the premium. So this slide shows, you know, hypothetically what 
that looks like. If 70%, if the total premium of the plan that you've chosen is $1,552 and UC's maximum contribution is $1,000, that means that $552 is going to be deducted from your pension income. That's just how it works. So pretty simple. If you are eligible for less than 100% of UC's maximum contribution using that same premium amount, this chart shows how those break down. And there's some examples provided just to give you a flavor of what it is. This, these numbers are, again, uh, for uh, hypothetical purposes only, but just show how the UC contribution changes based upon your eligibility. So if you are eligible for 100%. That's that first column in the lightest color, same, same as the last slide. Your cost, the amount deducted from your monthly pension check is $552. If you're eligible for 75% of UC's maximum contribution, the monthly premium does not change, but UC's contribution does. And so you have a <clears throat> greater amount deducted from your pension income, $802, based upon that example. And if you're eligible for 50% of UC's contribution, um, the, the amount deducted from your uh, pension income check is $1,052. So you can see this is the retiree health eligibility rules are absolutely um, engineered to motivate um, folks to remain working for UC longer in order to attain that higher maximum contribution. It is a retention tool that is used. <clears throat> now, your enrollments can change once you're retired. I mentioned that there, before we get into how the medical premiums are paid, I want to talk about what can change once you're retired. The, there are certain qualifying events that allow you to change your coverage, such as a new marriage or a new domestic partnership uh, or the birth of a new child or a new grandchild that is your tax dependent. Those are family members that you can cover as, a, as an employee, and those are family members that you can cover as a retiree. So if you have a life event that allows you to change your health plan coverage, or you have a life event that you're not sure, contact RASC or contact me and ask if you're eligible to change your health plan coverage if, if you want to. Um, I don't have any idea that you're having these life events uh, without uh, you letting me know, and neither does RASC. So if you have a change in your life that seems like um, it would be eligible, reach out and ask questions because you have to request that coverage within 31 days of that life event, that new marriage, that birth, um, that move out of area. If you are in an HMO plan, for example, um, you move to a rural county uh, in California from here in Santa Cruz, you move to a more rural county, your HMO plan may not work there. So you want to have coverage that's going to cover you where you live. Contact um, the university to ask about what your options are. If you've covered, been covered by um, a medical plan through a spouse and they're retiring now, you may have the option to change your retiree health coverage. So reach out with questions. And of course, moving on down, you can, you can always make changes during the annual open enrollment. And if you don't reach out when you have a qualifying life event, that's what's going to be available to you is the open enrollment period. So that's the period when you don't need a reason for making a change other than you want to. Any time of the year, you can suspend your UC retiree health coverage, say like you retired and then you, know, you return to the workforce and you have a new employer sponsored plan. You're not required to continue to pay those premiums for the UC health coverage. So you can suspend that coverage and then later on re-return to UC retiree health coverage. Um, if you pass away, your eligible family members may be eligible to continue health benefits. Um, if they qualify for continuation of UC monthly income upon your death, your family members very likely are eligible survivors and they can continue to have UC health coverage after your passing. So if that occurs, you know, contact the uh, retirement administration or your eligible family members would contact the uh, 
Retirement Administration. And I have in the appendix to this presentation a link to the Survivor's Handbook, which I think is a very good um, planning tool for uh, preparing for that eventuality. Returning back to how premiums are paid once you're retired. Well, the medical and the dental plans, uh, your share of the cost will be automatically deducted from your pension income. And if you're enrolled in the legal plan, that'll be automatically deducted from your pension income too. Um, the uh, some insurance uh, plans enable you to be eligible for a Part B reimbursement. If you're, uh, you and your family members are enrolled in Medicare, then you may be enrolled in a plan that entitles you to a Medicare Part B reimbursement. Uh, a Medicare Part B reimbursement is available if the amount that the university has budgeted for the cost of a particular medical plan um, exceeds the actual cost of the medical plan. In that case, the university does not keep that money. They give it back to you in the form of a Part B reimbursement, which is a separate line item um, on your UC pension income check. It's not part of your pension income. It's just a uh, reimbursement to you, and it's intended to defray the cost of your Medicare premiums uh, for part Medicare Part B because the university requires that you enroll in Medicare. Um, as far as Medicare premiums go, Medicare premiums are not paid by the university. They're paid by you. They, there's an individual in, uh, re responsibility for the individual enrolled in Medicare to pay premiums for Medicare, if any. And those are either deducted from your monthly social security income or if you're not receiving social security income, you can be billed directly or you can enroll in easy pay. I, I recommend enrolling in easy pay, but the university does not pay your, your Medicare premiums. That's what you should take away from this slide. Other health plan premiums are direct paid by you to the insurance company. So for example, the, uh, University has a retiree uh, VSP plan that it uh, negotiates for a group rate, but the premiums for that are not available to be deducted from your pension income. You have to pay, you have to enroll independently and pay premiums directly to VSP. Same concept applies to accidental death and dismemberment coverage, um, life insurance that you've converted or ported into an individual plan and supplemental health that you've uh, converted or ported into an individual plan. Pet insurance is available to retirees at the group rate, but is not available to be deducted from your pension income. So you pay that directly to Nationwide. And I'll just pause there to see if there's questions. Oh, let's see. I have a question. Is there a maximum or cap on the amount of UC contributions? The sample you used, 1552 said 100% coverage would be greater than $1,000. Okay, great question, Judy. The, uh, the example that I used used round numbers just for example purposes. Um, there is a maximum cap on the amount of UC contributions and the maximum is 70% of the aggregate cost of the retiree medical program. So you see budgets uh, to cover 70% as the maximum contribution um, for folks that are eligible for uh, UC retiree health. And if you're subject to graduated eligibility, it'll be less than that 70% maximum. I hope that um, answers your question and you're welcome to follow up if I need to go into that deeper. I'm gonna switch gears now to talk about Medicare. And this is just a slide showing what a Medicare ID card looks like, showing the effective dates for both A and B coverage. Often these dates are identical, but if a person was, for example, covered by an employer group plan past age 65, the dates could be different. Part A could have started earlier and Part B could have started when uh, the person actually left employment and enrolled in Part B. This is just to give you an idea of what the 
Medicare ID cards look like and what the uh, the information that's in contained on them and what you see will be asking for when you or any family members that you cover become eligible for Medicare. Because UC requires that retirees and their dependents enroll in and continuously maintain Medicare Parts A and B coverage if eligible. And when I say if eligible, I mean eligible for Medicare Premium Free Part A. If you're eligible for Medicare uh, Part A for free, you must enroll in Part B and uh, pay uh, Part B premiums if applicable. This is called coordinating your coverage and you coordinate your coverage with your UC medical plan because that helps uh, keep the cost uh, for the UC retiree health program down and, and makes the retiree health program sustainable into the future. Some medical plans uh, don't have Medicare coordination and you will have to change to another medical plan. That's our health savings plans for active employees enrolled in those. And I'll talk about those as we go forward. Um, generally, you see employees that work past age 65 or otherwise are eligible for Medicare coverage, including and their spouses, can delay enrolling in Medicare Part B until their retirement. So uh, the university, uh, neither the university nor Medicare have a requirement that you enroll in uh, Medicare Part B while still employed. And that's due to the fact that UC um, coverage would be primary coverage while you're employed. Um, the uh, university has... Um, or excuse me, the US, U.S. health insurance um, industry has a designation of what's primary coverage and what's secondary coverage. Um, and if you're employed and covered by an employer group plan, like the University of California's employee coverage, um, that would always be primary before Medicare. So if you're retiring after age 65 or you're covering the family member who's uh, older than 65, you can they can, you or they can reach, uh, defer enrolling in Medicare until you leave UC employment. Um, for domestic partners, it's a little bit different because the IRS treats domestic partners differently than, um, than spouses. And by extension, CMS has different rules for domestic partners. To avoid a Part B late enrollment penalty, if you're covering a partner while employed, and that uh, partner is uh, attaining Medicare eligibility, they're turning 65, they should be advised to contact the Social Security Administration for enrolling in Medicare Part B to avoid that penalty. So what is Medicare anyway? Um, the Medicare coverage is uh, begun in 1965 and started out with two parts, Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B. And it's a federal insurance program for those age 65 or older, some disabled folks, and those with end-stage renal disease. Um, Medicare is an insurance program. It's just offered by the federal government. And it pays for some, but not all, medical bills. It covers some, but not all, preventative services and coverage, just like the UC employee and retiree health plans is based upon medical necessity. The Medicare is also the foundation for all UC retiree medical coverage, which is, is another way of saying that UC's retiree health program is only sustainable because of folks coordinating their care with Medicare. Um, if everybody decided to uh, <laughs> disenroll from Medicare, the UC retiree health program would, would quickly um, be in trouble. And um, so UC requires that UC retirees that are eligible for premium free Part A enrolled in Parts A and B in order to retain their UC health coverage. Who qualifies for Medicare? Uh, anybody who contributed to Social Security for 40 quarters qualifies for premium free Part A. 
And so that means you've paid Social Security taxes and Medicare taxes for 10 years or more as part of your uh, working life in the United States. Um, even if you did not um, contribute to Social Security taxations, you may have 40 uh, through your UC employment, you may have 40 quarters through non-UC employment, such as, you know, um, when you're working as a teenager, you're paying Social Security taxes. Um, so you may have 40 quarters through non-UC employments or even consulting contracts. And you can also be eligible through a spouse or even an ex-spouse if your marriage uh, was of a duration long enough to qualify you for Medicare. So if you're uncertain, you can always visit the uh, Medicare website and I have their website listed later on in my, in my uh, program um, to confirm whether or not you're eligible for Medicare. But most people that have worked in the United States um, for at least 10 years or more are gonna be eligible for premium free part A. Medicare is different than Social Security. So Social Security and Medicare, um, people often conflate those. Um, and the take the takeaway that you should have is that um, the university does not determine your eligibility for Medicare. The Social Security Administration administers Medicare and can tell you if you are eligible for premium free Medicare. Social Security also is distinct from uh, uh, your Medicare coverage. So if you're receiving Social Security income, you're not necessarily enrolled in Medicare, although that would certainly be part of it. It could be part of that. Your Medicare eligibility is distinct from receiving Social Security income benefits. And qualification for Medicare is determined by the Social Security Administration. So Social Security has administration has two primary factors around Medicare, determining eligibility for Medicare and collecting premiums. So uh, Social Security assists you with enrolling in Medicare, but does not, um, and collects premiums around that, but does not perform the day-to-day -day functions around Medicare. Once you're enrolled in Medicare, then the Centers for Medicare Services govern the uh, medical coverage that you receive through your Medicare insurance. Medicare enrollment takes place um, generally around when you're 65. However, if you're employed past age 65 and you're enrolled in UC coverage as an employee, at the time that you turn 65, you are not required to enroll in Medicare Part B. It's not a UC requirement nor a, a Centers for Medicare Services requirement. And again, this is um, because your employer group plan would be primary coverage and Medicare would be secondary coverage. So uh, if you're enrolled in UC health coverage as an employee past age 65, you're allowed to defer enrollment in Medicare until you leave UC employment to retire or to otherwise leave UC employment um, without penalty. And if you're covering a domestic partner again, um, contact, have your partner contact Social Security Administration around their 65th birthday to become informed about their requirements about, for enrolling in Medicare. Uh, Medicare Part A is generally available to you at no cost, so you can choose to enroll while you're still working, but, and you will be automatically enrolled if you're receiving Social Security income. However, if you are in a health savings plan, you would want to defer enrolling in Part A of Medicare while you're still working and wait until you retire or otherwise lose your health uh, employer health coverage to enroll in Part A and Part B. But you, many people can and do enroll in Part A while working if they're working past age 65 because there's generally no cost. So Part B has a cost, Part A generally has no cost, and again, you can defer enrolling if you're working past age 65 until you leave UC employment because to enroll in Part B would be like asking you to pay Medicare premiums that you can't really use because your UC health coverage is primary. If you are uh, Social Security and Medicare, as I mentioned, um, uh, is kind of coordinated. And if you're qualified on your 
own and already receiving Social Security income about two or three three months before your 65th birthday, you should receive a notice containing your Medicare card and notification that your uh, enrollment in parts A and B is activated. This is when you're, uh, ret you're receiving social security income and you're approaching your 65th birthday. Um, if you're not receiving social security income, then you should contact the social security uh, administration to get enrolled in Medicare. And um, the, um, the social, I have a website that you can visit uh, to get enrolled in Medicare. It's called Getting Started with Medicare. And you can always feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about um your enrollment. But again, the Social Security Administration determines who is eligible. If you're already retired and you're approaching your uh, 65th birthday, about 90 days before your 65th birthday, the UC Retirement Administration Service Center will send you a packet of information and, and it will be addressed to the retiree um, and it will provide instructions about uh, completing the necessary forms for Medicare coordination. If you are retired and covered by an HMO plan, such as the Kaiser Permanente or UC Blue and Gold, you will be provided with a form to transition to a Medicare Advantage plan with Part D coverage. If you're uh, retired and turning 65, you will get a letter um, and you're covered by an, a PPO plan, you'll get a letter instructing you on the forms required to coordinate your Medicare coverage with a Medicare supplement plan. And that can be with or without Part D coverage. There's a couple of options available to you. We have one plan without a Part D plan. Um, dependents that you cover um, are also, again, required to enroll in Medicare as they become eligible. So as they hit their 65th birthday, dependents are also required to fill out those same forms. And uh, UC should be reaching out to you, uh, the retiree, about 90 days ahead of that person's birthday. But you can also reach out to RASC if you uh, haven't received anything. Um, that may indicate that the there is an address that may need to be updated. So always feel free to reach out with questions. If at the time that you leave UC employment, uh, you are already over age 65 or you're covering a family member that is over age 65 and you're retiring into Medicare eligibility, um, uh, you and your dependents will get all of the necessary forms that uh, are required for Medicare coordination at, as a part of your retirement process. There's also uh, often a form, a request for employment information that is required, and you can contact me for that information. I monitor, uh, I get a report of who has hit a certain um, stage of their retirement process that uh, provides me with information on who to perform outreach to. So I try to perform that outreach as I receive that reporting. Um, but you have to have like hit a certain uh, stage of your retirement process for me to, for, for your name to appear in that report. Um, so if you are thinking about your retirement process and think that you should be eligible for Medicare, you can always contact me for those forms as part of your retirement process, and I'll be happy to work with you on this. And again, if you're in an HMO while you're employed, you'll be transitioning to a Medicare Advantage plan. If you're in a PPO plan while employed, um, then you'll transition to a Medicare supplement plan in your retirement. And I've placed all of those forms in the appendix um, should you uh, need to take a look at them or have questions about them, they're linked in the appendix of this program. Um, a little bit of word about UC and Medicare coverage. So your dependents generally must be in the same plan as you. If a dependent, say a spouse, is younger than you or older than you, has a different Medicare eligibility than you, then there is Medicare partner plans. So uh, there's a Medicare version of each plan and a non-Medicare version of all of UC's plans. So depending on individuals that is covered, 
each family member will be in a Medicare plan or a non-Medicare plan. Uh, the non-Medicare plan is sometimes called the commercial plan. And they'll, uh, those individuals remain in the commercial plan until their Medicare eligibility. When you are um, enrolled in Medicare, the UC retiree coverage generally becomes secondary to Medicare coverage unless you transition to, an, excuse me, unless you are enrolled in an HMO plan, in which case you'll be transitioned to a UC Medicare Advantage plan. And I'll talk about those more as we go along. Again, paying for Medicare, there's a premium involved in Medicare Part B. And if you are receiving Social Security uh, income, your Part B premiums are automatically deducted from your Social Security check. However, if you have decided to delay receiving Social Security income until a later date, you can absolutely do that and be enrolled in Medicare. In that case, you'll be billed by the Centers for Medicare Services for your Medicare Part B premium on a quarterly basis, or you can enroll in Easy Pay. But I do want to reaffirm that to remain eligible for UC retiree medical, um, the Medicare enrollees must maintain Medicare Part B premiums um, and keep those premium payments current, and if applicable, Part D premiums as well. So how do you sign up for Medicare? Well, um, if you're in your retirement process, you can visit the Getting Started with Medicare page, uh, which is on the medicare.gov website. Um, I want to um, provide advice that you should be highly suspect and, in my opinion, avoid uh, websites that are not medicare.gov. There's tons of information out there. And it can be um, compromised or misleading information. So when you're looking for Medicare information, go to the medicare.gov pages for accurate information. Um, you can uh, apply for Medicare. Uh, I like the Getting Started with Medicare page and it's linked here on this slide. Um, if you turn 65 before you retired, Again, you'll need to provide proof to the Centers for Medicare Services of your creditable coverage, and you can contact me for that form. Otherwise, you may be um, subject to a penalty, and you can contact me as part of your retirement process. Um, you can still apply online and then send in the form that I'll complete for you within 31 days, and there, the form is linked in the appendix. And when you are enrolling in Medicare, you can uh, visit the Social Security Administration page or the Getting Started with Medicare page. I prefer the Getting Started with Medicare page that takes you right through to the um, Getting Started um, uh, page. Um, either way is fine. It takes you to the same place. And again, it is an individual responsibility to enroll in Medicare when eligible and you can get started at the Social Security website or at the medicare.gov website, getting started with Medicare. And there's the link. So uh, how is Medicare structured? Um, Medicare has four parts. Uh, Medicare Part A provides uh, coverage for hospital stays. It's hospital insurance. And this is financed by uh, payroll taxes. This is uh, that it's financed by payroll taxes over the course of an individual's career working in the United States is why it's called premium free Part A, because you've essentially prepaid for Part A um, eligibility just by working in the United States and paying Medicare taxes. Part B of Medicare covers medical services. So this is the part of Medicare that covers the uh, services that most people use. So this is going to the doctor, getting physical therapy, um, having um, a crutches uh, uh, prescribed for you or a wheelchair prescribed for you when you need them. Um, part B is the part that has a monthly premium that is payable, either deducted from your social security income or payable through easy pay. And it's the part of Medicare that is most widely used by uh, individuals in their day-to-day their -day life for medical care. 
those are called, Part A and B are called original Medicare. Part C was added later on, and Part C refers to Medicare Advantage plans. Um, these are plans that are uh, sold by individual insurance plans authorized by the Centers for Medicare Services to provide coverage for medical coverage um, and often include coverage for prescription drugs. Um, part D is the part of Medicare that covers prescription drugs. Original Medicare did not cover prescription drugs. And um, the UC coverage that is available as a UC retiree can often fulfill these components of the coverage. So UC offers Medicare Part C plans, Medicare Advantage plans, and UC retiree, pro retiree health program also offers Part D prescription drug programs that are bundled with our UC plans. And by uh, filling out the forms, then your UC coverage coordinates with your Medicare coverage. Again, uh, Part A is coverage for hospital stays. So that includes hospitalizations, stays in nursing facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and hospice care for end-of-life care, and some home health care. For most people, again, it's financed by the payroll taxes that you've paid over the, quarter, the course of your work in the United States, and therefore is called premium-free Part A because you've paid for it in advance. Part B includes the part of medical uh, Medicare that covers medical services. Again, it's those office visits, um, outpatient hospital care, so the rehabilitation, uh, lab tests, durable medical equipment, diabetic supplies, and um, other services like uh, therapies, um, re rehab, and some preventive services. Part B does have a cost. And um, there is a, um, uh, a payment structure that the uh, Centers for Medicare Services adopted as part of the Medicare Modernization Act to establish a baseline for Part B premiums and then charge higher costs for high income earners. Your Medicare Part B premiums, again, are deducted from your Social Security income. They're not payable by the University of California, they're payable by you. And you they're deducted from your social security income or via direct payment through easy pay or writing the check on a quarterly basis. Um, the social security uh, cost of living adjustment has um, nothing to do with the UCRP cost of living adjustment for the pension plan. Uh, um, I just want to say that because that uh, sometimes those two concepts become conflated. If you're receiving social security income, then um, there is um, a, a cost of living adjustment, which is separate and apart from any university pension income cost of living adjustment mentioned on this slide. Um, for most people, the uh, cost for Medicare Part B in 2024 is approximately $175 a month. So $174.70 to be precise. The 2025 rates have not been released yet and they probably will around in the, uh, the next coming weeks, um, but they're not yet released yet. Again, the premium for Part B um, as described on the previous slide, represents about 25% of the cost of fund funding Part B. However, um, you, if you are a higher income earner, um, then you may pay a higher rate. Um, the Social Security Administration can tell you the exact amount that you will be paying for uh, Part B. And um, uh, a Part B premium has, uh, since 2007, been based upon your income. These income-related uh, adjustments um, affect about 8% of the people with Medicare Part B. So it's a very small percentage. Most people will be paying $174.70 in 2024. But higher income folks can pay a higher rate, and those are based upon your income two years prior. For example, in 2025, your uh, income rate will be based upon your income from 2023. 
2025 rates aren't yet released, but I do have the 2024 Medicare Part B and Medicare Part D as in David rate chart in the appendix attached. But again, for most people, excluding that 8% of the population, for most people, it's about $174. And that's based upon an individual earnings up to $103,000 or for um, those that file a joint tax return, $206,000 um, in 2022. That would have been the amount of uh, taxable income for their 2024 rates. So again, most people fall uh, that are UC retirees fall under that amount. Part C of Medicare, returning back to that again, is those Medicare Advantage plans. So Part C of Medicare refers only to the Medicare in Advantage insurance plans run by private insurance companies as authorized by Centers for Medicare uh, Centers for Medicare Services. They are Medicare approved plans from a private company that offers alternative to original Medicare for your health and drug coverage. And these bundled plans often have uh, uh, Medicare Part D bundled with them. So uh, UC's Medicare Advantage plans uh, do have Part D included in them. And in Part D again is the prescription drug coverage. When you join a Medicare Advantage plan, Medicare pays a monthly fixed amount to the Medicare Advantage plan. So in other words, you assign your Medicare risk to the Medicare Advantage plan. And in exchange for assigning that risk, the Centers for Medicare Services tr uh, transfers money to that Medicare Advantage plans to managing your health, to manage your health care. Um, for this reason, Medicare Advantage plans often have uh, fitness uh, discounts and additional things uh, around preventive care that are intended to improve health outcomes because um, those Medicare Advantage can plans can receive additional funding if their um, plans are successful at keeping you healthy, keeping you out of the hospital. Um, once you are enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, you cannot use your medic, your original Medicare, Medicare Parts A and B separately. You have to follow the rules of the Medicare Advantage plan. And this can mean that um, you need to get approval from your plan before certain services or medications are covered by the plan. They, they perform uh, reviews and re may require prior authorizations but they'll also um, provide often uh, a lower out-of-pocket cost in the form of prescribed co-payments for care when you go to receive your medical care or prescription drugs. And UC offers two Medicare Advantage plans. They are the UC Medicare Choice PPO. It's the partner plan to the UC Blue and Gold plan carried by HealthNet. And the second Medicare Advantage plan UC covers uh, provides is Kaiser Permanente Senior Advantage, which is the Medicare partner plan to Kaiser HMO plan. And then there's, what about Part D? So Part D is simply the prescription drug insurance program. Again, uh, these are run by private insurance companies as authorized by uh, Centers for Medicare Services. Part D became a requirement as part of the Medicare Modernization Act. And um, you must be covered by a Part D plan or risk a penalty. Part of the Medicare Modernization Act determined that um, all retirees at some point or another are going to have a prescription drug need and so must carry prescription drug insurance coverage to in order to uh, cover those needs. Um, there are all of UC's um, UC retiree health plans have a Part D component except for one plan. UC carries a UC Medicare PPO without prescription drug coverage. And the um, university carries this plan um, in, to, in order to offer a full array of options available to UC retirees. Many, if not most of our UC retirees decide to go with the UC uh, prescription drug plan, Part D plan, 
uh, through their UC retiree health simply because the university is contributing towards the cost of it. But you can choose to go out and shop for your own Part D plan and enroll in the Medicare PPO without Rx, but there is only the one plan. Um, Medicare Part D uh, premiums uh, subsidize the, uh, the overall program. So Part D is basically a payment mechanism, but you do have to be covered under a Part D plan or risk receiving a, a penalty assessed by the Centers for Medicare Services. And that uh, Medicare Part D plan must be equivalent to or better than Part D plans as uh, prescribed by the Centers for Medicare Services. And all of UC's UC retiree health plans meet that threshold. They're all equivalent or better than the Part D coverage prescribed by Medicare. And therefore, they are all considered creditable coverage, except for that uh, Medicare PPO without prescription drugs. When you are enrolled in a Medicare Part D plan, there may be formulary differences from the commercial plan that you've been covered up until, that, uh, until you transition to that plan. So that is one uh, point to look at when you're transitioning from a commercial plan to a Medicare plan. There may be slight formulary differences and you're encouraged to look at the formulary. Um, part of the point of today's um, presentation is to position you to be uh, well established in your road to retirement. So if you're thinking about retiring in 2025, um, go visit the retiree portion of the open enrollment website and look at the formularies for the Medicare plans that you want to be covered by in your UC retirement. And um, this is uh, um, that will allow you to transition with uh, the least amount of um, disruption to the continuing care that you're receiving. As far as retiree medical plans and Part D coordination, there is a form that's going to be necessary for each family member. And this uh, completing the Medicare coordination form will be part of your retirement process if you or a family member that you cover is eligible for Medicare over age 65 at the time that you're retiring. Um, retirees with, uh, with Medicare are enrolled in Part D um, with their UC plan. And um, if you're transitioning straight from employment to uh, Medicare retirement, then that'll be all that you need to do as part of your retirement process. You don't need to do anything else than complete that form. You, people of a certain age receive a lot of mailings um, from insurance companies that want to sell you products. And I'm here to tell you that, and this may make you happy, that you can ignore all of those mailings and outreaches and television commercials and radio commercials about enrolling in a Part D plan if you're planning to get your um, Part D coverage through the University of California Retiree Health Plan. In other words, all of the UC's plans that the UC offers as part of retiree health meet the requirements with the exception of the uh, Medicare PPO without Rx, and you would have to purposefully select that plan. You're not going to be transitioned into that plan as part of your retirement. You would choose that plan during an open enrollment period and would have to provide proof at the time that you're making that selection that you're enrolled in a non-UC Part D plan. Um, as I say, many, if not most, the overwhelming majority of UC retirees get their Medicare Part D coverage through the University of California's plan. Um, so you don't need to do anything else to enroll in Part D. And in fact, you should not be if you're going to have your coverage through UC retiree health, because an enrollment in another Part D plan will result in a loss of all UC medical coverage. Just as there is uh, higher premiums for Medicare Part B, there can be higher premiums for Medicare Part D for higher income Medicare enrollees. Um, for most people, there is no additional premium required for Medicare Part D as in David. Um, just the, the, the premium that you pay for the Part D coverage that you receive through UC retirement 
satisfies all of the required payments that you need to make. However, if you're receiving a higher income, you can be assessed a higher um, Part D premium, and that's just added on to your social uh, to the uh, deductions that are coming out of your social security income check and um, or uh, added on to the quarterly statements that you receive from the Centers for Medicare Services. Again, that chart is located in the appendix of this presentation and you can also uh, check out the Medicare website to uh, see those income thresholds. Um, that will tell you uh, what is needed to, uh, um, what the income is for the additional Part D premiums. And there is also a, um, an appeal form in the appendix if you believe that that uh, assessment is unfairly applied. You can appeal that. And if you feel you're being overcharged, you can appeal through the Social Security Administration by requesting an appeal in writing or by, um, and you, you'll be informed of the outcome. And that chart, or excuse me, that form is um, included in the appendix. Now, who can you see when you're covered by Medicare? Well, when you see physicians that accept Medicare. So that is a requirement. Um, all medical care must be medically necessary. And um, the, uh, Physicians that accept assignment are those that accept Medicare and will accept Medicare rates for services. Um, it's important to know that the overwhelming majority of physicians in the United States do accept Medicare. There are some physicians that don't accept Medicare assignment and can charge a higher premium, but they're certified with Medicare. So you can still see those doctors. You may just have a higher out-of-pocket cost when you see those doctors. Physicians that do not accept Medicare will not be covered under your Medicare provision. However, UC plans uh, may cover some specific care um, for uh, physicians that do not accept Medicare or other providers that don't accept Medicare. So this is uh, the benefits beyond Medicare that are covered by UC plans often are most are most often applied to uh, care from psychologists, uh, acupuncturists, chiropractors, those folks may not accept Medicare. They may or they may not accept Medicare. In those cases, Medicare will not pay anything for that, uh, for that coverage, but your UC plan may have additional benefits that do cover um, at least a portion of the care that you receive from those providers. What's not covered by Medicare? are the things listed here, which I'm not going to go through because your UC retiree coverage when coordinating with Medicare often covers those gaps. Um, for uh, uh, example, the Medicare Part A deductible, um, the uh, Part B deductible, and hearing aids are all covered by the UC retiree health coverage that is coordinated with your Medicare. And UC Retiree health plans can cover care that you receive outside the United States in an emergency where Medicare would not cover that. Again, uh, for more information, visit the medicare.gov website. Avoid those websites that have a .com or any other dot something else after them. Always go for the real information from medicare.gov or you can call the, these numbers and I'll just pause for questions to see if there's any in the uh, chat. I see one that um, already retired and turning 65 in May, 2025. Should you keep your current PPO with UC during open enrollment in order to keep your current doctors? And should I make sure to see my PCP before my med Medicare starts? I would say, um, should you keep your current PPO? Well, that's a decision that you have to make. I can't make that decision for you. But in order to keep your current doctors, that's uh, probably a good move. And um, you may want, uh, since you're turning in 65 in May, that would be the smoothest transition. So the Medicare doctors should not change. The doctors that you see should not change when you uh, transition from the commercial plan to the non or to the Medicare plan. So uh, 
again, I can't make that decision for you, but that's probably a good idea if you want to keep your current providers. And uh, the follow-up was, should you see your primary care physician before Medicare starts? Well, uh, you should always see your primary care physician about once a year. And um, that is a good idea, especially if you haven't seen your primary care physician in some time. Um, I know that certain medical groups in our area are uh, not uh, seeing Medicare uh, supplement or Medigap members, which would be what it what you have in a PPO plan for new Medicare members. So uh, new is a, a term that the medical group determines. Um, and it can be, if you haven't seen that doctor in at least a year or so, that doctor can say, oh, uh, I can't accept any more Medicare uh, patients. If you've been keeping consistent with seeing that doctor on an annual basis, there should be no problem. But I have had reports from retirees that, you know, they waited several years to see a doctor. And then when they tried to go back and were already uh, enrolled in Medicare, the doctor said, oh, I'm not, I'm no longer accepting Medicare members. That is a determination that the doctor makes. I, I can't influence that. Um, those are reports that I have. So my short answer is contact your doctor and um, check in with them to see if they can continue to see you. Um, if there's no more questions, I will go on and talk uh, more in depth about UC coverage and Medicare. So I've covered kind of the parts of Medicare and now we're going to drive into deep dive into the UC plans or the partner plans and um, how they can differ from what you have as a commercial plan. The plan benefits may differ um, slightly. The costs will certainly differ. The service area can differ and the network providers uh, may differ. So information regarding the possible uh, Differences include that costs are different and often service areas may differ. For example, a uh, doctor, as we discussed um, previously when I was answering that question, a, doc a doctor may accept your non-Medicare plan, but may not accept the comparable Medicare plan. Um, <clears throat> Medicare plan costs are typically less than the non-Medicare plans because uh, Medicare is contributing to the cost of your health plan coverage. And so it's lessening UC's cost. So that will tend to bring uh, your monthly premiums down in aggregate, even factoring in the monthly Part B premium. The net expenditure for healthcare can often be less than before coordination with Medicare. And some upcoming slides will show these uh, calculations and I'll go into those. So um, for uh, again, you see uh, retirees and their Medicare options, the non-Medicare retire, uh, the non-Medicare family members and retirees will remain in the same plan as active employees. So if you are married to someone who's over age 65, they're going to transition to the Medicare plan and you can remain in the non-Medicare plan or you could flip that over. In retirement, the uh, Retirees will transition to either Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Supplement plans, also called Medigap plans. UC calls them Medicare Supplement plans, but they are can be called Medicare, Medigap plans. Those are synonymous terms. And UC retirees that uh, reside outside of the uh, state of California, but within the United States, and everybody's enrolled in Medicare, they're going to be transitioned to the UC Medicare Coordinator Program. And that will uh, allow you to be enrolled in a Medicare plan that exists in the state in which you live because uh, medical insurance plans are um, regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. So if you move out of California, um, the university isn't holding you hostage to you know, only one plan. They're going to allow you to choose a plan that works in the state that you reside in and you can choose from a range of different plans. And each uh, Medicare enrollee can be enrolled in different plans. Things to consider um, before your enrollment, uh, or excuse me, before your retirement is open enrollment is the time to look at your plans for next year. 
So look at the Medicare version of, or the partner plan. They may have different benefits, especially look at those prescription drug benefits. As I mentioned before, there may be formulary differences. Not all primary physicians or medical groups um, accept Medicare. So ask your doctor. When you go to uh, your next primary care appointment, say, hey, do you accept Medicare? Like I say, over 90% of the physicians in the United States do. Um, behavioral health providers are of a lesser percentage that accept Medicare. So ask your providers when you visit them, do you accept Medicare? And uh, Medicare plan service areas may also differ from the non-Medicare plan services areas or the commercial plans. For example, Kaiser Permanente um, members can be enrolled in um, the Kaiser Permanente HMO and live in Monterey County while they're working. However, if you are enrolled in Kaiser Permanente and then you're over 65 um, in transitioning to Kaiser Permanente Senior Advantage, Kaiser Permanente Senior Advantage is not available to Monterey County residents at this time. It may be in the future, but currently at this time, it's not available. So if you have questions, you can always um, feel free to reach out, but I just want to make you aware of those differences. Um, some retirees will be eligible for a Part B reimbursement. Um, again, this does not apply to all medical plans, but when the UC contribution is greater than the monthly premium cost that you see um, uh, applies to the uh, Medicare plan, you can be eligible for the difference in the cost. This is called the Medicare Part B reimbursement. This is not part of your pension income. It's a separate line item and it changes on a year to year basis. So uh, inevitably in uh, January, I often get questions, why did my pension amount change? And it's often due to a change in the Medicare Part B reimbursement. Um, it may be available to you, but it's not available to everyone. It's, it's a based upon your graduated eligibility. Um, generally, only retirees with a great, greater percent of graduated eligibility are eligible. It depends upon the medical plan and it depends upon your covered dependents. If you're covering a dependent that is not Medicare eligible, you're very likely not going to receive a Part B reimbursement. And if everybody in the uh, family is Medicare eligible, you could be eligible for a Part B reimbursement. And again, it's not a fixed line item, but exists whenever the cost of the Medicare plan is actually less than the amount that the university has budgeted towards the contribution. To give you an example of that, um, here is a, uh, another page for hypothetical purposes. These are not real premiums, so don't use this in your planning, um, but just to illustrate the point. Um, a person who is eligible for 100% of UC's contribution um, is enrolled in a plan uh, that had, that actually costs $500 per month. But the 70% contribution that the UC has budgeted is actually greater than $500. It's $640. In that case, the university doesn't keep that money. They give it back to you in the form of a line item on your pension income check. They pay that $140 to you, and that is intended to defray the monthly Part B premiums that you are required to pay in order to retain eligibility in the UC plan, UC Retiree Health Program. If you are eligible for 75% of UC's maximum contribution, then uh, the cost of the, uh, the premium doesn't change, but the amount of the UC contribution does, in that case, you're not gonna be eligible for the, the Part B reimbursement and you'll actually pay a monthly premium. And if you're eligible for 50% of UC's maximum contribution, that third column in this chart, um, you are not going to be eligible for Medicare Part B reimbursement in that case either, but your monthly premium will go up because you are eligible for a lower percentage of the university's cost towards that contribution. So again, um, this example is here to illustrate the, um, the uh, concept of a Part B reimbursement. It's there when UC has budgeted greater 
than the amount that you are required to pay for your actual plan that you're enrolled in. If you are transitioning from a UC HMO into Medicare, you're going to transition to a Medicare Advantage plan. So these are the Medicare partner plans. In that case, you assign your Medicare benefits to the Medicare Advantage plan. And once you're enrolled, Medicare pays a fixed monthly amount to that insurance company to manage your health care. You're, you may not use your original Medicare outside of your Medicare Advantage plan. You have to follow the rules of your Medicare Advantage plan. And UC's uh, Medicare Advantage plans all have a Part D component, so there's no need to enroll in a non-UC Medicare Part D plan. And in fact, do not take action to enroll in a Part D plan or risk disenrollment from UC's plan. Um, the HMO partner plans are listed on this slide. If you're on the UC Blue and Gold while employed or pre-Medicare eligible, you'll transition to the UC Medicare Choice. And if you're in Kaiser Permanente, you'll transition to the Kaiser Permanente Senior Advantage. Those are the Medicare Advantage plans that the university's retiree health program offers. These plans are available in California only and many California counties, but not all. I mentioned a few slides ago that there is uh, not availability for these plans in Monterey County. That is true for both of these plans. So um, if you are enrolled in a um, UC uh, Medicare Advantage plan and you live in a rural area, these plans may or may not be available to you, and you can reach out to me if you're planning a move to a rural county or you're planning to move outside of California. The differences um, in the coverage when you transition are very few. There's a, a name change, and um, the, the, you'll receive a new ID card. It'll have a Medicare Part D logo on it. And there may be some differences in the prescription drug formulary. But the uh, intention of the university's program is to provide a smooth transition. And so the copayments that you are used to are often um, they're applicable with the Medicare uh, Advantage plans as well. And as I mentioned earlier, some doctors may not accept Medicare patients. So talk to your doctor in preparation for your transition to Medicare. Moving on to the UC Medicare PPO plans. Um, UC offers a couple of PPO plans. So that's the UC Care Plan, the Core Medical Plan, and the UC Health Savings Plans. Those are collectively known as the uh, PPO plans. And the uh, partner plans to those would be the UC Medicare PPO and the UC High Option Plan. In that case, you have uh, multiple insurance plans covering you. So when uh, Medicare, when you transition to Medicare, Medicare is your primary insurance and is often referred to as original Medicare, as opposed to Medicare Advantage plans that work with HMOs. Um, when you transition to Medicare and you're covered under a PPO, your Medicare is your primary plan. And then the secondary insurance plan is your UC plan, your UC Medicare PPO or UC high option. And it's often uh, called a uh, mini gap insurance. Med UC calls it a Medicare supplement plan. And these plans are designed to uh, pay things that Medicare doesn't cover, fill in gaps, and then pay additional um, uh, funds for the medical care that you receive after Medicare has paid for those services. So any medical care will be submitted first to original Medicare, Part A and B as applicable. And then after Medicare is paid, then your Medicare PPO plan, your supplement plan will pay after Medis Medicare has paid. And will oftentimes pay Part D coverage. Oops, sorry. Sorry, skipped that too fast. The partner plans for UC Care PPO and CORE is the UC Medicare PPO. If you're enrolled in the UC Health Savings Plan, um, that is not compatible 
and with uh, Medicare plans per IRS regulations around uh, um, medical plans that have an HSA. And you'll pr be provided with a 31 day PIE to enroll in another plan acceptable under Medicare retirements. So if you're transitioning from employment and you're uh, enrolled in UC Care or CORE, you'll transition to the UC Medicare PPO in, as part of your retirement process if you're, um, and you're, you're retiring over age 65 or have a family member that's over age 65. If you're enrolled in the UC Health Savings Plan and somebody in your family is over age 65, you'll be provided with an opportunity to choose a new plan because of that Medicare uh, disallow, uh, the Medicare prohibition against HSAs. And um, this assumes that you're living in California. If you're retiring and you're moving out of California and everybody covered is going to be under Medicare, then you'll transition to the Medicare Coordinator Program. As I mentioned before, the UC Medicare PPO plans are UC Medicare PPO and UC High Option. In that case, Medicare is your primary coverage. The UC plan is secondary. Medicare primary means Medicare pays first. Secondary means the UC plan pays second. When you go to receive medical services, you show both ID cards. You show your Medicare ID card and your Anthem Blue Cross ID card when receives when receiving services. And you must use Medicare certified providers. That's those physicians um, in the United States that participate in Medicare. So ask your doctor if they accept Medicare patients. If they don't accept Medicare patients, then you may need to switch providers. The um, UC Medicare PPO and CORE versus uh, the UC Care and CORE versus UC Medicare PPO with RX has a few differences. Um, if you're enrolled in the UC Medicare PPO, you have two ID cards, one with a Medicare Part D logo on it, and that's the one that you take to the pharmacy when you receive services at the pharmacy. So one card is for medical services. You bring both your Medicare ID card and your UC Care excuse me, UC Medicare PPO ID card when you see receive medical services. And when you go to the pharmacy, you bring your prescription drug card also issued by UC Medicare PPO. There may be some differences in prescription drug availability because the Medicare uh, mandates certain drugs. So again, if you're transitioning to Medicare, look at the formulary and you must use doctors that accept Medicare. Um, when you see doctors um, that accept Medicare, oftentimes you don't have a deductible to meet, but some doctors uh, like psychiatrists that don't accept Medicare or psychologists, then you will have a deductible to satisfy. It's a $100 annual deductible, um, which is payable. And after that deductible is satisfied, then covered medical services are uh, covered at a percentage, a co-insurance. Most of the time it's 80%. And um, that 80% is paid after Medicare is paid. So if you go to a doctor that accepts Medicare, Medicare covers 80%, then the remaining 20% is billed to your UC Medicare PPO plan. Um, and the UC Medicare PPO pays another 80%. That leaves you with a coinsurance of 4% or 96% coverage for that medical care that you received. If you transitioned into the UC high option plan with Medicare, um, then your deductible, it's, it's all the same things I said on the last slide. You'll you receive two ID cards. One is for use at the prescription drug coverage. So bring it to the pharmacy and you must use doctors that accept Medicare. The differences are that when you see uh, physicians or providers that do not accept uh, Medicare, your deductible is lower. It's $50 instead of $100. And then after Medicare pays, the plan generally pays 100% for medically necessary care, um, leaving you with no additional cost. This plan is only available to select during open enrollment. You can't there, get there directly from um, through the retirement process, you have to positively elect it 
in retiree open enrollment. Um, you should do a cost benefit analysis to um, make sure that it um, meets your needs because the UC Medicare PPO plan is so similar in so many ways and there's a much higher premium for the high option coverage. Um, really take a hard look at those premiums, but if you decide that you want that coverage, that coverage is available to you to elect during open enrollment. And um, this plan has uh, a lower deductible of $50, and then after that's satisfied, the annual uh, the uh, coverage is 100% after Medicare pays. So it can reduce your cost to zero. <clears throat> If you retire after age 65 or cover someone else who is over 65, but then you retire, um, there's a chance that you might receive a late enrollment penalty notice. Um, so if you receive that, this is just a heads up, but if you receive a late enrollment penalty notice, it's very likely that you are not subject to a late enrollment penalty because you did have continuous health plan coverage um, while employed. So if you receive that notice, first thing to do is call your medical plan at the number provided on the notice. And if they are unable to help you, then you can call me um, to, <clears throat> to obtain information about the coverage that you had during your UC employment um, after turning age 65. Um, all of the university's uh, medical plans include credible prescription drug coverage, um, so they should exempt you from that coverage. And uh, you should call if further help is needed. If, like, for example, if you don't remember what plans that you had while you're employed, I can pull up historical information. But um, that's the uh, alternate path. The first thing you should do if you receive a late enrollment penalty notice is to call the number on the notice for additional information. Because oftentimes those notices are automatically generated. And in the meantime, um, they've received confirmation from UC of continuous coverage. <clears throat> for employees, excuse me, for retirees that uh, move out of California, but reside within the United States in their retirement, the university has developed a UC Medicare Coordinator Program. So this uh, Medicare Coordinator Program is only applicable if all family members are enrolled in Medicare, it doesn't apply if any family member that you're covering is not um, Medicare eligible. And the Medicare Coordinator Program has two components that allow you to participate in a medical plan that covers you in the state in which you live. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, in the United States, um, Medical plans are regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. So um, the uh, intention of the Medicare Coordinator Program is to allow UC retirees with options to choose from uh, plans that work in the state in which they reside and funds a health reimbursement account to pay for that uh, coverage. So UC pays via benefits to um, higher uh, benefit counselors to help you get enrolled in a plan, and then um, funds a health reimbursement account on an annual basis for uh, uh, with per capita funding. So for each family member, up to $3,000 is available uh, in funding from the University of California for every family member to select a medical plan um, in the state in which they reside. If the um, plan that you select is less than $3,000 annually, which is very possible, then the, um, the money in that health reimbursement account can be used for qualified health expenses, such as um, you know, going to the doctor and paying the copay, going to the pharmacy and paying the pharmacy copay, um, even things that are non-medical, like getting prescription eyeglasses or dental work done, those are qualified health expenses that that health reimbursement account can uh, fund. If that $3,000 is um, uh, less than the premiums, the cumulative premiums uh, that you for the plan that you've chosen, then you just pay the, the anything above the $3,000. And that um, $3,000 can be carried year over year for um, um, 
ongoing. So if you have, you can accumulate funds year over year, if you don't exhaust them by the end of the year. Um, if you uh, are um, receiving um, UC health reimbursement um, funding and you're subject to graduated eligibility, then the uh, prorate, there is proration applied to the percentage of the UC contribution based upon your retiree uh, graduated eligibility group. So it could be less than $3,000, but for many people, it's uh, $3,000. I also like to provide folks with a uh, notification because I often get this when people are going through the retirement process. Uh, a no, uh, uh, outreach in panic that they received a COBRA notification. This is required. Um, when your employee benefits end at UC Santa Cruz and retiring is a, a version of uh, uh, leaving employment, um, your employee benefits end when you leave UC employments. And so transition from employee coverage to retiree coverage is considered an termination of employee coverage under federal labor laws. And the university has to send out a COBRA notification and your medical plan will also send you a medical termination notice. However, if you are eligible for UC retiree health benefits and you do not need COBRA continuation of coverage, you can disregard this notice. Um, but if, if, Ness, if it makes you feel better, you can call me. I'm just giving you a heads up that when you go through your retirement process, you will receive a COBRA notification. And so uh, the following slides are to take you through an appendix of resources. The first one has my contact information. There's my phone and my email and the telephone number for the UC Retirement Administration Service Center. When you retire from UC, it's almost like you're uh, switching your UC uh, location, you're transitioning from um, UC Santa Cruz to uh, RASC. You can think of it as a transfer to a new uh, UC location. And RASC is often going to be your first contact whenever you have questions. Um, there's a new um, retirement counselor group, I'm so happy to say. Um, we've been, um, we, the UC community has been asking for retirement counselors uh, to be available for MASC. And I'm happy to say there is a, a stable of retirement counselors available and you can book an appointment um, with a RASC retirement counselor. Um, you can uh, follow that link to rask.universityofcalifornia.edu to that booking tool and book an individual appointment to ask questions. I've also included social security um, phone numbers should you need those and the Medicare website as well as, as HICAP. Um, for folks that may retire from UC and not have any retiree health eligibility, uh, HICAP is the abbreviation for Health Insurance Counseling and Advocacy Program, and they can counsel you on non-UC health plans that are available to people um, with Medicare eligibility. Um, if you have questions about your health plans, um, you look at your ID card. There's often helpful insure information on your ID card. If nothing else, there will be a telephone number for you to call to contact your medical plan. Um, where can you find your information? If you're looking for employment information, including historic W-2s, go to UC Path. If you are looking for your retiree health enrollment, your monthly uh, income statement, your year-end tax statements, go to UC Rays. RAE stands for Retirement at Your Service. If you've uh, worked for UC way back when, um, you may remember at your service online. That was the old version of um, a retiree uh, uh, portal. Uh, UC RAE is replaced at your service back in 2019 and uh, is the place that you go for pension income, reporting, your year-end tax, tax uh, statements, and um, life events such as, you know, changing your address, updating your phone number, um, sharing a new email address. You can do that all on UC Race. If you have monies on deposit in a retirement savings program, uh, Fidelity Retirement Services will be the place that you go, and you can visit Net Benefits. You can also uh, designate your beneficiaries for those plans because those are kept separate. Uh, your beneficiary designations for retirement savings plans are kept separate from 
your UC be beneficiary designation. So go take a look at that every once in a while. I've also included a bunch of different um, informational uh, of resources that are available to you, such as the Retirement Handbook. I've referenced that several times throughout this uh, presentation. Um, an initiation form for initiating your retirement if you're not able to do it through UC Rays, Medicare fact sheet, premium estimators, medical plan costs, um, the, the rules for UC retirees about uh, who's eligible and who's not and what to do when, um, Medicare coordinator program and open enrollment. It's all here. And they're all contained on the um, UCNet website, ucal.us slash UCNet is the place that I recommend that you bookmark. I also have a bunch. And these are resources for Medicare. Um, this is the rate chart that I indicated. This is 2024 rate chart. And uh, 2025 will be added on the uh, same website when that is automatically updated. So the URL will not change. It'll just be automatically updated when Centers for Medicare Services gets that posted. Um, I also have um, the request for employment information form and who to contact if you need that. You can contact me. I'm happy to answer those questions and complete that form for you. And then uh, the request for reconsideration on premium rates. If you uh, feel that you're unfairly charged a higher uh, premium rate for Medicare Part D or Part B. That form is listed here too. And that's all that I have for today, except for a reminder that we have open enrollment uh, starting next Thursday. So a week from tomorrow and the premium rates will be posted at the um, UCNet website um, beginning tomorrow at some time of the day. I don't know what time of the day, but we're expecting those tomorrow. And if there are any closing questions, go ahead and come off of mute and feel free to ask those questions. And for those that hung in here through this whole presentation, I'm so appreciative of your attention and your time today. And I wanna thank you very much for coming. Um, this uh, is uh, a time of, um, I appreciate you coming and taking the time to learn about this. And if you have any follow-up questions that you wanna bring up with me, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. And um, I'll just uh, hang out for a little while to see if there are any questions. Just a reminder, this presentation will be recorded, it has been recorded, and we will be um, sending it to you after the presentation today. Thank you. And a huge thanks to Tess, my uh, producer today, and my uh, UC Santa Cruz co-pilot for 